And we are in the number six of the series, the sixth uh, session in the series on Ecclesia. And we have spent the past three messages talking about the need to grow up. And now we want to shift and start talking about, in this session, a body functioning in divine order. We had a taste of today in our worship time what, it, what it's like when the body contributes, whether you know, someone had a song, another one had a, a prophetic song, another one had a prayer, another one had a, a specific message, and all that together brings us to what the Lord desires so much in his body is for his body to function in divine order. And so we're going we're gonna to focus on that here in this teaching today. So let's turn in our Bibles to Ephesians 4. Verse 16, and, and actually we're going to read, we're going to start with verse 13. Is Paul's writing about fivefold ministry, and he's, he's basically saying, here's what Paul is basically saying in, in this passage, is Paul saying that everyone in leadership, whether you're an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a teacher, or a pastor, are called to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Now, primarily what Paul is trying to get at is he's trying to say God's eternal purpose is, is intended to be fulfilled. And he's calling leaders to equip the body to see God's eternal purpose fulfilled. Now, we have spent an enormous amount of time looking at that, but specifically, Paul highlights to us in verse 13, he says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God. That word in the Greek actually means a precise and a correct and a full knowledge of Jesus Christ that comes, and this is what this Greek word, this is the richness of this Greek word, that comes out of an active and experiential relationship with him. That's what that word means in the Greek. Fivefold leaders are called to bring the body of Christ into that intimate relationship with him of knowing Jesus Christ that comes out of that intimacy to we come to a precise and a correct knowledge of him. Now, the next phrase is what we've been focused on so much is the Lord is looking to bring forth a mature man, not an individual. See, we so often are thinking individual. We're so often are thinking me and Jesus. We're so often thinking about me and my relationship with the Lord. But the Lord is not working merely individually. The Lord is working to form a corporate man. And I think back in session two, we looked at what that means, that God is raising up a one new man that is to become conformed into the image of the heavenly man, Man as he is intended to be, the corporate man, male and female, without any distinctions between Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free. This is the burden on Paul's heart. And he says, the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Jesus Christ. The fullness of Jesus Christ can never, ever, ever come by a few individuals. Catch, capture God's heart here. The book of Ephesians is not written to you and to me. The book of Ephesians is written to the corporate church. See, God, see Paul's writing this inspired by the Holy Spirit to bring the church into God's eternal purpose. Now this has obviously an individual application but God's vision is so much greater than an individual. The Lord is working to form a mature man. Now, the first place he wants to form a mature man is in the local gathering of the ecclesia. This local gathering of what we call the church. God wants in this to form a mature man. The Lord wants here in this place not just to have one or two, three or four, people who are fully mature, God wants the entire body to mature into the image of Jesus Christ. And then from an individual level, then being fit together as his body, we become this corporate representation of him. 
a mature man. Now, that's, that, that's the logic Paul is dealing with. Now, in verse 14, a verse we've been focused on for the last three messages, Paul says, as a result, or therefore, we are no longer to be children. And we looked at some of the things that keep us immature, embracing another Jesus, offense, familiarity, uh, negligence, and uh, the fifth one. Uh, what was the fifth one? Yes. Anyone remember the fifth one? I, that's a bad one. How am I supposed to expect you to remember if I can't even remember the fifth one? There was a fifth one, but $100 for anyone who can tell me. No. <clears throat> anyway, I guess it's not important. No, it is important. There is a fifth one that is just not in my head right now. But there is a fifth thing that keeps us immature. But God wants us. Huh? That's part of negligence. But that's, uh, that's, that's good, Randall. Um, but God wants us to grow up. That, that is the apostolic exhortation that Paul's giving us. As Paul says, we are no longer to be children. We're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and, and craftiness with deceitful scheming. Now, in verse 15, Paul tells us we are to speak the truth in love. And we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head. See, God's desire for us is he wants us individually to grow up. And in that place where the individual part of the body grows up, what happens is then the corporate church grows up. See, God is so focused on the corporate. He's so focused on this mature representation of his son. And so anyway, he says, grow up. Now, in verse 16, Paul is going to tell us how that happens. He says, from whom the whole body, being fit and held together but by what every joint supplies. So in other words, what Paul's saying here is, how this happens is through connection. A joint is a connection. A joint is a joining place, just like your elbow here. It's a joining place in the body. It's through those connections that who we, who we are in Christ in terms of the, the measure of Jesus Christ, the measure of his life that fills us, that, that measure of his life that fills us as we are connected one to another in real authentic relationships, the measure of Christ that we, that we walk in and the measure of Christ that you walk in as we are connected one to another, that measure of Christ, this is what this, this verse is meaning, that measure of Christ that we each carry individually, when that measure of Christ works effectively, and that measure of Christ works efficiently, then Paul tells us the growth takes place. Now, he's not talking about numerical growth here. Other places talk about numerical growth. This in particular is talking about the growth of the body unto maturity. And so Paul is exhorting us He's saying the measure of Christ that you have, the measure of his life that you have allowed to live. In other words, you are not living, if, if that part of you, if there's still part of you living, you're limiting the growth of the body. If you're still living and not Christ is living in you and through you, you're limiting what God wants to do. That's why it's so important that we, that we yield to the indwelling Holy Spirit. It talks about in James that the Spirit of God is jealous for you. He does not just want to remain in seed form inside of you. He doesn't want to just remain hidden in your spirit while your soul lives. The Holy Spirit is jealous because the measure of Jesus Christ that you, we walk in individually is going to be determine the measure of the mature man that we are going to have corporately. 
And so, you know, you've, you've heard of the term the weakest link. A chain is as strong as its weakest link. And, and that can totally be applied to the body of Christ. It can totally be apl applied to the body. Is, is if the body is weak, that if the individual members are weak, that if the individual members are immature, that hinders the body coming into the fullness of Jesus Christ. That's why we want to be those who embrace Christ and his indwelling life fully and yield to him internally so that Jesus Christ who lives in us can have us and he can live. That's what Paul's getting at here. Now, let's now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Verse 26. Verse 26. See, Paul is going to tell us how the church is meant to function. See, we are still, I am still, we are still in the old paradigm of what we think church is meant to be. A two-hour service, a place you go on Sunday, a building See, it's so hard for us to say, you know, where do you go to church? And I mean, how many of us still ask people that? Where do you go to church? And I'm trying to catch, catch, catch myself and stop doing that because it's really unbiblical. See, we are the church. We are the ecclesia. We are the people called out of the busy life to gather together under the headship of Jesus Christ and to express his indwelling life together corporately. See, we are called to function interdependently. We got a taste of that during worship today when we waited on the Lord and different members of the body added to the meeting and each, each person adding to the meeting brought us up to an entirely different level that we wouldn't have had if it would have just been, well, that's the worship team's responsibility or that's the pastor's responsibility. And so Paul is giving us this vision of what New Testament church life looked like in the first century. See, the, the New Testament church life in the first century was never led exclusively by one person. It was never exclusively led by a worship team. It was the body coming together to express the life of Jesus Christ interdependently. Here's what's shocking about this. What's shocking is Paul is about to write this scripture we're going to read. He's about to, he writes this to the most carnal church in the scriptures. The Corinthian church filled with jealousy. The Corinthian church filled with carnality, selfish ambition, and strife, and sexual immorality, and all of this stuff. Childish behaviors. I mean, it was so soulish. You would think, and I say this as a leader, I would say, God, the last thing I would ever do in this church is to encourage them to an open and a participatory meeting. <laughs> I would say that's the last thing I would ever want to see happen. This is already chaotic. If you are going to encourage everybody in the body to minister and to express what God is saying, you are opening a can of worms. You are opening up for chaos. That's the way I think. That's the way a lot of leaders think. But that's not the way Paul thought. It's kind of shocking that Paul would go into this church and he would actually encourage every member, even living in carnality, to express a lot. Now, I'm not encouraging carnality by any means, but I'm saying that, that's what Paul's vision was. Paul's vision was this is not meant to be a one-man show. This is not meant to be the Apostle Paul's one-man show where you come and you listen to the Apostle Paul speak. Now, there were times when certainly that happened, but Paul is giving us a vision for the corporate, a vision for the ecclesia, a vision of what body life is meant to be in the New Testament. See, so much of what church has become in America and around the world was handed down after Constantine 1,700 years ago. It has so much of its roots in that where it's all built around one man instead of the man, Jesus Christ. And so God wants 
to unlock the body to minister and to express the life of Jesus Christ together, interdependently, corporately. So Paul, he asked the question, he says, what is the outcome then, brethren, when you assemble, each one has a psalm, each one has a teaching, each one has a revelation, each one has a tongue, each one has an interpretation. See, I bet I could really convict you all today if I asked this question and I said, how much time did you spend for this coming service in asking the Lord what he wanted to do and say? So I bet I could really convict you. I'm not going to. But that's how we think. We're so wired into the old paradigm to think we are going to go to church as a spectator, sit in our seat, and listen to what this person says or that person says that we never even think to ask the Lord, what are you speaking and what are you saying for this Sunday? See what I'm saying? But this is the way the body is meant to function. This is the way the body is meant to move. This is the way the body is meant to work. This is the way the New Testament church functioned, that this body would contribute what Christ is doing in them, what the Spirit of God is doing in them, and they would bring to the meeting a revelation. They would bring a word. Now, obviously it doesn't mean if we let every single person speak every single Sunday, we would be here till 4 o'clock. So we're not saying that every single person is going to speak. What I'm saying is you, you, we want to be prepared and seeking the Lord, Lord, what are you speaking, what are you saying? Open participatory meetings. So it's such a different paradigm of what we're used to. Now, as I say that, let's look at down in, in verse 40. It is This verse is crucial. Because any leader will tell you that you're opening a massive can of worms. That's probably why most churches don't function this way is because you're opening up chaos if you don't have order. And Paul says, all things must be done properly. There's a proper way to express the life of Jesus Christ corporately. There's a proper way to express what the Lord is saying as we gather together. Everything needs to be done in an orderly manner. So what I want to do in this message, probably going to be another message, maybe even another one, I'm not sure, is I want to talk about divine order. A body functioning in divine order. Now, you know, the, the exhortation to us is, is begin to seek the Lord. What is he speaking for Sunday? Don't just come as a spectator. What is the Lord saying? What song will you bring? What word will you bring? But God wants us to establish divine order. Now, having said that, I want to I say this. This is a throwback to the past. But raise your hand if you remember Garbage Pail Kids. Okay, so this is showing my age. They came out in 1985. I remember Michael's not here, so I can talk about him. Michael, my brother, who's five years younger than me, I think he had every single Garbage Pail Kid known to man. I mean, he was obsessed with Garbage Pail Kids. I never really got into him. I was, I think, 13 or so when they came out. Michael was about eight. Michael got so into Garbage Pail Kids. Now, if you, if you want, this will be the only time I'll ever let you look on your phone while I'm preaching. If you want to Google real quick Garbage Pail Kids, they were, they were making fun of Cabbage Patch Kids, but you could look up some names are Adam Bomb. And so what they would do is they would take these, they would try to make these humorous things like Adam Bomb, the one for Drew is Corkscrew Drew, Up Chuck, or Unstitched Mitch, but it was all these different, different characters. You should look at them, they're pretty crazy. All these different characters of these Garbage Pail Kids. And so anyway, I thought, okay, I'm going to teach on divine order and I want to introduce you to Charismania Kids. Charismania Kids is coming from over 25 years of leading a charismatic church. I have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of the charismatic movement. I mean, I thought I had seen it all until this past week we got together with a friend of ours, and he, works, uh, he worked for a while at a very large charismatic ministry, and he taught me 
way much. I mean, he told some stories where you're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> that is crazy. But anyway, I have put together in this, in this teaching, I've put together my Charismania Kids and the point of the Charismania kids is to have a little bit of fun as we talk about divine order. Some of these people are real people. Some of them are exaggerated. I have a tendency to exaggerate some. So some of them are exaggerated. Some of them are real. I'm not going to tell you which one's real, which one's exaggerated. But I want us to look at the Charismania kids so that we can learn some lessons in divine order. All right. So the first person... I'm going to introduce you to is Close Talker Carl. This is a real person, by the way. You can ask Angie. Close Talker Carl. Close Talker Carl, as his name suggests, is a close talker. Close Talker Carl does not know how to get into a conversation with you unless he is literally three inches from your face. When you're talking to Close Talker Carl, you can literally smell his breath. You can literally tell he had tacos for dinner. The thing that happens, this is a real, I'm, this one's real. The thing that happens is as you're talking to Close Talker Carl, you're taking a step back and he's taking a step forward. You're taking a step back, he's taking a step forward. And by the time you realize that you're pinned, this, this happened, and then you can ask Angie, you're pinned into the corner of the wall and Close Talker Carl's like this, like, you know, talking to you. And you're like, dude, you need to like get some space around because, you know, this is way too much. The thing about Close Talker Carl is Close Talker Carl is also a shofar blower. Now, it's okay just to blow the shofar once or twice in a service, but Close Talker Carl feels the need every single time you make a good point to blow the shofar. So you turn to, you know, so for example, you say, okay, turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Close talk, Talker Carl just begins to do, 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 do. And you say, okay, there is now, no, there's now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Close talker Carl blows the shofar again. So, you know, during the service, he blows it like 30 times. And you're like, okay, all right, you, you need some training here, Carl. The first lesson that we can learn about close talker Carl is, is on page three. If we're going to give public expression of what the Spirit is speaking to you or doing in you, we need to be self-aware. See, Close Talker Carl was not self-aware. <laughs> he had no awareness of, you know, personal space. He had no awareness of, okay, when's the right time to share this? Okay, he had no awareness of like, okay, Maybe I don't need to blow the shofar after every single point the, the message in the message. Maybe I need to just kind of say, okay, is this the right expression at the right moment? Am I being too loud or am I being too quiet? Am I expressing or am I, am I, is what I'm expressing affecting those around me? You know, you want to ask those things. Is the expression beneficial to the body? That's really important. See, because what we want to ask the question is, is what I'm feeling or is what I'm experiencing or is what I'm sensing, does it benefit the body? Does it benefit the body? Because, see, what can happen is you can be hearing from the Lord, and you can be hearing from the Lord accurately. You can be experiencing the Lord. But you want to ask the question, okay, is what I'm going to share, is what I'm going to express, is what I'm going to say, does it benefit the body? Does it add to what God wants to do? See, close talker Carl didn't realize, because he wasn't self-aware, he didn't realize that he was becoming a distraction. He didn't realize that what his expression was being was, okay, he needed some self-awareness to realize, okay, let me just step back for a minute and ask, is all what I'm doing necessary? Is what I'm doing building up the body? Does that make sense? See, I've found, you know, just in my own experience, is when I first started walking in, you know, hearing from God, I thought every single thing that I ever received from the Lord I had to share publicly. You know, if God was speaking this or God was speaking that, and I would just automatically, okay, i got to share that publicly. 
Well, a lot of times the Lord's like, you don't need to share that. You don't need to express that. You don't need to say that. You don't need to do that. Just wait. See, we don't want to just... We don't want to just do something because we think it's the charismatic thing to do, right? We want to do it because it's the right moment. We want to do it because it's the Spirit of God leading us. We want to be self-aware to say, ask myself this question, okay, Lord, do I need to share this at this moment? Now, that doesn't mean we get overly nervous or timid or hesitant. Now, don't go to the other extreme to think, okay, I'm so in fear that if I share something, it's not going to be at the right moment. It's not going to be at the right time. And so what we do is we hold it in. So we're not to be that way either. We're not to have fear or timidity about any of that. But we, what we do want to be self-aware. We do want to say, okay, is this benefiting the body? Now, let's look at 1 Corinthians 14, verse 28. 1 Corinthians 14, 28. Paul gives us a principle here that, that really is, is really insightful. And he says, if, if there's no interpreter, he's talking about the gift of tongues. If there's no interpreter, and I'm just going to phrase it like this is if we are sensing something, if we're sensing, you know, if God's moving on us individually, we want to ask the question, how does what I am about to release publicly, to when I want to say publicly so people can hear what you're speaking, how does this benefit the body? How does this build up the body? How does this add to and, to and contribute to the body? Now, again, don't get over analytical where you're like so paralysis of analysis that you're afraid to share. But ask, you know, how does it benefit the body? Because that's what Paul's saying here. He's saying that if there's not a benefit to the body, then just keep silent in the church. Don't, don't just keep, your, keep the encounter you're having with the Lord between you and him. See, what, in other words... What Paul's saying here, bringing in divine orders, what he's saying is, is that what we are going to speak out publicly, this could apply to prophecy, it could apply to words of knowledge, it could apply to praying, it could apply to singing, it could apply to travail, tongues and interpretation, it could apply to, to any different, it could apply to shofars, you know, to any different manifestation externally, this would apply, is we would ask the question, okay, how does this benefit the corporate body and if it doesn't have if it's just something God's doing between me and him then I'm just going to keep silent now that doesn't mean you got to just not say anything but just you know keep it toned down like tabashaba you know if you're praying in tongues karabashibidianda where where it's not distracting the corporate See, what, what Paul's saying here in terms of divine order is we want to say, if this is beneficial to the body, then let's share it. Does that make sense? See, self-awareness will help keep us in divine order. Number two is be aware, be, or beware of your favorite external manifestation becoming a charismatic ritual. See, for Carl, Carl felt like when he blew the shofar, he felt God's presence. Now, that, that was, that's great. That, that's great. He felt God's presence by blowing the shofar. Except Carl was blowing it 30 times during the service. I, of course, I'm exaggerating a little bit. But he was blowing it so often that it became a disruption. See, Carl should have realized, okay, I don't need to let my favorite external manifestation of the Spirit become a charismatic ritual, become a formula, become something that I depend on. See, the Lord is experienced and encountered internally. Now, that doesn't mean we don't encounter Him externally because we do, but the, the place where God is moving is internally. The place where God is wanting to speak to you is internally. And the question is, okay, is what I'm hearing 
internally meant to be expressed externally. For example, today when we were in our worship time, it was beautiful. Everything was done in, in beautiful order. And, and, and that's where the beauty of this comes. That's where the beauty of what God wants to do comes is when we learn to, to sense the, the right expression of the Spirit at the right moment. Now, again, that does not mean like paralysis of analysis, get into fear, over paranoid that, you know, I'm going to become hesitant to share this because I don't want to disrupt this stuff. You know, we're never, ever going to be perfect. We're never, ever going to have absolute perfection. That's not what we're trying to get out here. We're just trying to get some equipping of how, okay, if we're going to move in, if we're going to move in divine order, if we're going to have divine order, then here's the lessons we need to learn self-awareness. And I've seen it so often in the charismatic movement is what begins by the Holy Spirit can often be carried out in the flesh. We can experience God one way and we then think, okay, this is the way we are to encounter God. This is the way that we are to experience God. And I shared a while back about me when in Kenya, I'll share it again in case you didn't hear this, but me and my, my ring finger, I shared the story. And so I was praying for people in Kenya, and I felt nothing, and we were praying for a line of people. I felt nothing, 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 nothing. I get to this one lady, and all of a sudden, the electricity of God, the power of God flows through my finger. It was like electricity. I go back to the beginning of the line and pray for them again and again and again, nothing. Pray for this lady again, and the electricity of God came so strong through this pinky finger, I kind of developed this thing like, well, maybe God has called me to be the ring finger prophet, where I just lay hands on people with my, my ring finger, and then the electricity of God flows through me into them. So I really, really, just for real, I was thinking, okay, Every time I pray for someone now, I've got to use my ring finger and lay it on their foreheads. And even in, I remember when we were in Kenya, I was like, okay, hold the babies back because they are going to fall down under the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I was literally afraid to pray for babies. And so anyway, no one else ever, ever got touched by my ring finger, okay? So I, what I did in my immaturity as I took one way God moved one time, and I turned it into a ritual and a formula. Now, I'm sure God wasn't mad at me. I'm sure God had a great laugh at me. He's like, look at him. You know, he thinks he's going to heal people just by the ring finger. You know, but us charismatics, we, we, I've seen it so often. We, we do that. We take one way that God moved, and we turn it into a ritual or a formula to think this is the way God's going to move this Sunday. Last Sunday, God moved with shouting. If we want God to move this Sunday, then let's shout. No, the Lord's not in the shout this Sunday. The Lord's in the silence. The Lord's in the whisper this Sunday. Okay, the next Sunday we come back, okay, we need to be silent before the Lord because the Lord is in the silence. And he's like, no, I'm calling you to have the shout of the king among you. See, we want to be led by the Spirit of God and not attach to any of our ritualistic, charismatic formulas that we think work and that we think bring in the presence of God. The, the formulas, the external manifestations don't bring in God's presence. It's Him living in you, you obeying what He says inwardly to express it externally is what brings His presence. It's what brings the breakthrough. It's what brings in the presence of God. So what we learn from close talker Carl is that we need self-awareness and we need to beware of repeating our favorite manifestation. The second profile we're going to look at is puffed up Patrick. Puffed up Patrick, he's been saved two years. But Patrick thinks he knows the Bible better than anyone else. Patrick thinks he knows the Lord better than anyone else. Patrick thinks, puffed up Patrick thinks, 
I hear the voice of God directly from the throne. Therefore, I am not accountable to elders. I am not accountable to you. I am not accountable to the body. When if God is going to speak to me, he's going to speak to me directly because I am a prophetic voice of the Lord. Puffed up Patrick. See, puffed up Patrick, he doesn't think he's ever wrong. You ask puffed up Patrick, hey, are you sure you've heard from the Lord? Absolutely, 100%, I've heard from the Lord. No soulish mixture possible? No soulish mixture possible. Well, you've been saved for two years. <laughs> you know, I, the, the stuff I'm walking in this day can be 20. Patrick, how do you know that, you know, how do you know there's no mixture in all this? See, Patrick thinks it's me and Jesus, and there's no need for the body. See, Patrick doesn't realize that sometimes God speaks through the body. Puffed up Patrick has allowed pride to enter into his soul, and now puffed up Patrick thinks he hears from God, and everything he hears is always accurate. Because Patrick is so confident, because Patrick is so confident in what he is hearing from the Lord, Patrick, puffed up Patrick, always gives his words and prefaces them like, thus saith the Lord. The Lord says, or if he's really feeling really close to God, he says, Papa says. See, Patrick thinks he has this intimate relationship with the Lord that no one else has and that he doesn't need to benefit from anyone else in the body. But Patrick does not realize his own uh, pride has blinded him. Pa Patrick doesn't realize that even in his hearing, there's soulish mixture. Patrick hasn't learned how to separate the soul from the spirit. So lessons we can learn from Puffed Up Patrick. Number one is that we are called to walk in humility and honor toward one another, knowing your need of each other. Now let's turn to, well, in, in your notes here, this is a pretty amazing scripture. Paul or Peter is talking about in 1 Peter 5, 5 through 6, he says, you younger men... Younger in terms of how long you've been walking with the Lord. Be subject to your elders. And all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Now catch this right here. For God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Wait a second. I thought humility towards God was expressed vertically. I thought humility towards the Lord is the way I was approaching him this way. Well, yeah, you're right. But Peter tells us there's another dimension of pride that we can walk in towards God, and it's pride towards the body. And this is where we all fail. It's easy to be humble to God. It's easy to be humble to the Lord. It's easy to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God when you're thanking him vertically. Where the test comes is horizontally. Where the test comes is in the body. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Well, how? By humbling yourself towards one another. Puffed up Patrick did not have any concept of the body. Puffed up Patrick did not have any idea that his own pride, he was, thought it was me and Jesus vertically, and yet God was saying, your test and your humility is how humble you are to the body. That's where we fail. That's where we fail. Because God in his humor will connect us with people that will drive us crazy. If you don't think that, just ask a married couple. Not that Angie drives me crazy, but I drive her crazy. I know that. 
won't go into any details, but the litmus test of our humility is measured by how humble we are to the individual members of the body. See, Jesus said to Saul of Tarsus, he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? See, whatever the, whatever we treat the body is the way we treat Jesus himself because in his eyes, his body is him. And so when we are proud towards the body, we are proud towards him. When we're walking in pride towards the individual parts of the body, we're walking in pride towards him. That's why he says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, clothe yourself in humility, not towards God, though, yes, we need that, but that's not usually the problem. Clothe yourself in humility towards one another. Here in our notes, let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Not only do we need humility towards one another, but we also need honor towards one another. We need to show honor to the body of Christ. We, you know, we need to honor one another. Paul's talking and he says, whereas our more presentable members have no need of it, God has composed the body giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked. Down in verse 26, he says, if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. See, this is something lacking so much in the body of Christ today is the lack of honor among the body. There's such a lack of honor in the body. We're so quick to criticize and we're so quick to judge and we're so quick to say this person is doing this thing wrong and that person is doing this thing wrong you know you know we might have gotten to the place where we show honor to leaders which is the thing we, the scriptures command us to do but it's also we're supposed to show honor towards even the least of the members in the body see puffed up patrick did not show honor to the body. Puffed up Patrick, yes, he was humble towards God, but towards the body, he was filled with pride. And being filled with pride towards the Lord or towards the body meant he was prideful towards the Lord. See, the Lord is calling us to walk in honor, showing honor, showing respect to the individual members of the body, even the least of them. Even the, even the person you would think, okay, this is the least person, you know, the, I don't even have a need of you. But we're like, no, you're absolutely wrong. To the least of who you think is the least, you should be showing the most honor towards. See, that's what the, you know, if we're going to minister corporately, we've got to have that kind of humility towards the whole body showing honor to the body and recognizing our incredible need of the body. Paul even talks about you can't say, the eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you. We can never say to the body, I have no need of this. I have no need of you. You're not necessary. This is irrelevant. You know, every part of the body is vital to the growing up of the mature man. So we want to walk in humility. We want to walk in honor towards the individual members of the body, knowing our need of every single member. See, we cannot have the fullness of Christ in our prayer closet with me and Jesus. It's not going to happen. We can only have the fullness of Christ as we have him individually and then corporately as we learn to express his life interdependently depending on each other. See, so God calls us to walk in humility. God calls us to walk in honor. The second thing we can learn from Puffed Up Patrick is be humble about what you believe you're hearing from the Lord. 
See, unless you have been taken directly to the throne room of God and you have seen the resurrected and glorified Savior, you want to be very careful about using phrases and what you're hearing from God as, thus saith the Lord or the Lord says. When I first started to prophesy, I always said, thus saith the Lord and the Lord says. And the Lord had to correct me as like, you need to be a less dogmatic in using that phrase depending on the way you receive the revelation. I mean, if you're taken to heaven and you see the Lord face to face, you can say, thus saith the Lord. But if you're, if you're sensing something in your spirit that's very open to being mixed in with your own soulish interpretation... It's better to be less dogmatic in expressing what you're saying, and it's better to say, I feel like the Lord is saying this, or I, I sense the Lord is saying this. You know, open to, to the possibility that, you know, maybe, maybe what I'm sensing or maybe what I'm hearing, maybe, it, it, you know, I, I think it's the Lord, but you know, let's test it. Let's judge it. Let's see if... What I'm hearing is really the Lord that's speaking, or did something get mixed in? Is part of this the Lord, and is part of this me? See, we want to be humble to what we think God is speaking, because if God is really speaking something to us, the fruit of it is going to make it known whether we've heard from God or not. We don't have to say, thus saith the Lord, to give evidence that God's speaking. We can look at it and see the fruit of it and say, yes, that was indeed the Lord who said it. That makes sense? We want to show humility in, in the things that we are speaking. The third thing is, and, and we, we've shared this before, but we always want to share words with an elder and let them determine if and when it's appropriate to share corporately. We had, a, we had a, a great example of this last Sunday. That This just shows you dad's humility. Dad, who's been the pastor for how, 20, however many years, 25 plus years, felt like he heard something from the Lord of what he needed to do. And Larry felt like he had something of what he needed to do. And so Larry submitted it to the elder, my dad. And dad, you know, dad who, you know, he could have just said, okay, I feel like, you know, without even asking me, could have just said, taken the microphone and said, this is what God's saying. No, even him said, hey, this is what Larry is feeling. This is what I'm feeling. You know, I think we need to do this, this, and this. I was like, yeah, absolutely. So even dad, that's a beautiful example of humility. Even dad, who's been doing this for 20, 30, year, however many years, realized even then he wanted to be submitted to the person that was leading the service for that particular Sunday. And, and look at how beautiful that was, what Larry did and what my dad did last Sunday. It just brought such a presence of God. It was so beautiful. And so the point is, is that it, it's a safeguard. It's a safeguard to share these words with elders who are responsible for directing the flow of the service. It's not any way going to quench the Holy Spirit. It's going to make sure that, I mean, not, not that we're without you know, we're obviously not perfect by any means. We're going to miss it. But it, uh, it helps get the, all the things we're feeling and sensing to be placed at the proper time and the right expression. And so, you know, a lot of us know that, but it's important to, to understand that. Now, let's turn real quick to, to Jude. If you ever want to feel good about your, your spiritual life, read the book of Jude because you can read that, the whole book, in like 10 minutes. But... Jude is writing about the church. This is, where, this is where the fear of God comes into this. Puffed up Patrick. If puffed up Patrick doesn't get corrected, this is where puffed up Patrick will eventually lead. Is verse 11. It's, Jude's talking, he says, Woe to them, they have gone the way of Cain. They have rushed headlong into the air of Balaam. This is where I'm getting at right here. 
They have perished in the rebellion of Korah. If you don't know about Korah, what happened is number 16. Korah begins to hear from God. And we assume that Korah is hearing from God accurately. But what happens is Korah begins to say, hey guys, we don't need Moses. We don't need the leadership. We don't need all this structure and this stuff that would keep us from having freedom. We don't need this leadership. We have got our own direct connection with God himself. We don't need to go through Moses. We don't need to submit to Moses, the divinely appointed place of authority. And so what Kor did is he led a rebellion against God's leadership, against the elders. And I'm seeing this, not, 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 obviously I'm not seeing this here, but I, I'm seeing this more and more in the body of Christ where people thank God they know they don't have to go, they don't have to go through a mediator to get to the Lord. They don't have to go like we saw before the Reformation through a priest to, to get to the Lord. They don't have to hear God through me. They can hear God directly for themselves. You can hear God directly for yourself. You don't have to go through any leader. You don't have to go through any man or woman. You can hear the voice of God directly for yourself, which is beautiful, which is wonderful. But puffed up Patrick, what he didn't realize was he didn't realize that God had put authority in his life, elders in his life, and those elders were a safeguard for him. And, and so puffed up Patrick was very close to the rebellion of Korah. The Lord has really highlighted this to me. Again, not, I don't feel like it's a huge problem here, but it, I see it more and more growing in the body of Christ. Just a, a lack of honor towards the leadership God has placed and established in his body. Thinking that I don't need this leader. I can go directly from the Lord, and you can go directly to the Lord. But disregarding the authority God has placed in your life. It is a safeguard. A safeguard. See, when we get into that spiritual pride... When we get into that spiritual pride of me and Jesus and no other, me and the Lord, I'm a voice of God from the throne. I don't need spiritual authority. I'm not subject to spiritual authority. We are in a dangerous, dangerous place. Dangerous place. It, 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 it puts the fear of God in me. It, it really does. It, it puts the fear of the Lord in me. And I had that attitude when I first started serving dad in ministry. That was my, my attitude was like Cora. I was like, why do I need to do what my dad says? I can hear from the Lord. I'm prophetic. I've got these gifts. I've got this call of God on my life. You know, this is my dad. I mean, this is, you know, this is a long time ago. But I, I didn't show honor until the Lord convicted me. You are like Cora, Brian. You're like Korah. Now, I wasn't leading a rebellion, but I easily could have. The Lord had to correct me. He, you know, and, and, you know even, even, even in my pride, speaking out and saying, ah, you know, why does he do this? Or why does he do that? This is a long time ago. Again, it was yesterday. But, you know, why, why does he do this? Or why does he do that? And the Lord is like, you are not grumbling against your dad, Brian. You are grumbling against me, just like he said to Moses. They are not grumbling against you, Moses. They're grumbling against me. What happened was my own spiritual pride got in, and I thought because I'm gifted or I can hear from the, God, from the Lord, I've got this revelation, I've got this scriptural knowledge, I don't need the God-appointed authority that God has placed me under. I can go directly to the Lord and hear from him. 
and my dishonor towards my dad, the Lord used that, exposed that in me to show me that pride could have been my downfall. See, puffed up Patrick, if he does not begin walking in humility towards the body and towards the leadership God has placed as shepherds into his life, puffed up Patrick could eventually go the way of Korah, speaking against and cursing the leadership God has established in his life. And it did not end well for Korah. It did not end well for him. As we bring this to a close, God wants to, if anything, God wants to more and more and more raise us up as a body that is contributing in the service. God is more and more and more wanting that. God, God needs every single person in this place to, to, be, to be listening to the Lord, to be contributing in the service at the right time, at the right moment. You know, learning these lessons. See, these lessons are not meant to quench you. These lessons are meant to help streamline the effective working of the body so that Christ is now made manifest in the body as a mature man. These are meant to help us, not restrict us. These are helped to liberate us and bring in the, the flow of the Spirit of God in proper and divine order. The body working interdependently, expressing the life of Jesus Christ together. It is, it is such a beautiful thing. It is so beautiful. Don't let even the, the fear of like, I'm going to miss it or I'm going to be wrong here or whatever. Don't let the fear of that keep you from doing and, and saying what God is putting on your heart. Don't be hesitant. Don't be timid. Don't be shy about the gift that God's given you. Use that gift. Express that gift. But do it in the context of divine order. Amen. Amen. Well, Lord, we just come right now. And we just ask you to fill us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Father, we just pray that we would, you would establish divine order. Teach us about divine order, we pray, Father. That we would, we would be a body functioning in divine order, we pray. In the name of Jesus, Lord. We want to really see the life of Jesus Christ flow through us more and more and more, Lord. I just want to pray, Father, that you would establish us in divine order. Lord, teach us how to be seasoned. This is all about, this is all about seasoning. This is all about becoming mature and the expression of the Spirit of God, all about a, a maturing of our expression of the Holy Spirit together. I just pray, Father, that you would do that. You would establish us in divine order. I just pray, God, that you would just release the gifts of God among us corporately in such a way, Father, that we would go to an entirely new levels together with each member of the body contributing to the overall flow of the Spirit, we pray. And I just pray, God, that we would be anointed, Father, to express Christ corporately in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We can stop the recording.